Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, delighted to have you for the physics colloquium today. Um, super excited today to have two of, uh, of our own folks from Slack. Um, so our speakers today are Kimmy Wu, who is a new Panofsky Fellow at Slack. Um, Kimmy did her PhD here at Stanford in Chow Lin's group, and she's been a postdoc at the University of Chicago uh, since uh, uh, and just joined us um, here um, this fall. And uh, the second speaker today, and I think they're going to trade off, uh, is, is Daniel Gruen. Uh, Daniel Gruen is also a Panofsky Fellow at Slack. He's been with us a few years. Um, Daniel did his PhD in, in, at LMU Munich, and he was a postdoc at KIPAC before coming a Panofsky Fellow. And uh, Kimmy and, and Daniel are both uh, experts in different aspects of survey cosmology, so really at the forefront of mapping out the universe. So Daniel is primarily mapping out the universe in the optical, and Kimmy is primarily uh, mapping out the universe in, in microwave. Um, and uh, really excited to hear them sort of give us the landscape of survey cosmology uh, and, and where we are. So welcome and, and thank you and please go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much to all who are joining in today. Um, so we'll be covering some topics in optical and CMB survey cosmology. And I'm Kimmy and the other speaker is Daniel in the screen. So now um, we'd like to start a talk with a brief activity. Um, so that will introduce you to the technology that we're gonna use throughout this talk, uh, which is this pollavy.com. Um, so if you all go to this link there, then you can put drop a pin on um, some the, the, your current location and we can get a distribution of where everyone's calling in from today. Um, so we'll be using this throughout the entire talk. Um, so if you get it set up now, you'll get to participate throughout. So, um, so I'll wait for a 30 second to a minute um, for the result to show up. I think, I think it will show up live. So you can see pins get dropped on the map as people respond live. And I think I see pins, uh, more and more pins get dropped already. And um, now we can do a visual uh, clustering analysis on these pins, Daniel. <laughs> already, a lot of, a lot of uh, folks around Palo Alto for sure. So there is a highly non-Gaussian high density um, points in that in that region you have one person in southern california kind oh. of envy you weather wise that's right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very cool all right so you all have a warm-up exercise and uh let's let's move to um the oh wow you get to can, a name is all oh, right one thing is that you don't have to put in your name you can still participate all right very cool uh, so let me then move to the next slide. Does it work? Just click, should work. Um, okay, let me just click. Let's see where that's. Oh, somehow we're stuck. There we go. All right. Okay. Technical difficulties. So now uh, I'll give a brief roadmap of um, uh, this talk, um, some of the main themes that we're gonna cover through uh, both CMB and optical surveys. So um, this visual here illustrates um, parts of the uh, various stages of the universe that we'll, we'll cover in this talk. And um, from left to right are the early to late universe. So we, we are on the late side of this figure. Um, the purple line um, kind of roughly sketch out the size of the universe as a function of time in scale and units of uh, scale factor. Now on the leftmost side um, is inflation. So that's a time in which the universe underwent um, 
an exponential expansion, uh, a near exponential expansion. And in terms of structure, we just use this kind of fussy graphic of really denoting we don't know what uh, quantum fluctuations look like. Now, um, after inflation ends, um, we enter the standard hot big bang period of the universe. And um, that's when the universe structure wise look like a fluid of elementary particles. Um, so there are photons, electrons, protons. And because these um, um, electrons and protons are charged, so the photons are tightly coupled um, in this fluid. What that means is that the universe was opaque to photons. It's not until the universe had expanded and cooled enough that neutral helium and hydrogen can form that the universe then become transparent to photons. And that's when uh, photons can freely stream to us. Uh, at that moment is when the CMB, um, one of my key observable, uh, the cosmic microwave background was formed. And that era is called the recombination. Uh, since the recombination, we have a uh, stars and galaxies um, formed and galaxy clusters. So that's denoted by this background image in the middle, uh, beautiful image of galaxies and clusters. Um, with that, we have structure formation and um, there is an effect, particular effect on the CMB because of these deepening gravitational potential and that is CMB lensing. And CMB lensing will also play a key role in this talk. And of course, uh, imaging of these galaxy is key to the optical survey. Uh, at the end here is our kind of our local universe. You see highly non-Gaussian structures and also we have entered this dark energy domination era in which the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And needless to say, we are cosmologists. Um, uh, at the end uh, of this, of this um, timeline where in which we use specialized uh, instruments to observe both the optical and the millimeter wave universe. On top here, I'm showing camera from the dark energy survey that maps uh, use CCD's technology to map the optical universe. And at the bottom, I'm showing a, a picture of the South Pole telescope uh, that is equipped with a tech detectors and optics that maps the millimeter wave uh, sky, um, including the CMB. Now, just really roughly, the CMB, because it is a snapshot of the uh, early universe, is sensitive to the physics uh, of the really, really early universe, including inf inflation. And that's one of the key parts that I'll address in this talk. Um, however, you might think that, oh, um, CMB does, is not sensitive to the lake structure. And that's not true um, because CMB lensing, uh, the deflection of the CMB photon pass, um, makes CMB also uh, sensitive to large scale structure. So the CMB kind of covers um, uh, this, this history of the universe kind of both early and late. Um, uh, on the optical side, uh, because it's directly imaging the formed structure, so it's more sensitive to the late universe part. Now what we do with these surveys essentially is that we take pictures of the CMB and of the galaxies and stars. Um, and from these pictures, we extract statistics from them. Uh, that's our measurements. And from these measurements, we compare them to our cosmological models. Uh, as we have mentioned, I'll be covering the CMB side of things and Daniel will be covering the optical side of things. So some, let me highlight a, a sample of some burning questions that some of you might also have heard uh, from the cosmological community. Uh, the first one is, uh, that might be the uh, most clear one uh, from outside in looking from the outside in is the Hubble tension. So it, it occurs to us that the direct measurement of the local expansion of the universe um, seem to be um, discrepant from um, expansion rate and for, from early universe measurement, including ones from the CMB. So why is that? Uh, another kind of in, in the line of tension issue is um, it seems that the inferred amount of st structure clumping, uh, it's different when we use different kinds of probes. Um, so what causes that? Is that new physics? Is that systematics? Uh, or, or is that something else? 
So I, I kind of filed this category of questions under um, stress testing our standard lambda CDM cosmological model. We have another, another big area which covers a discovery space in this survey cosmology. Uh, and I have a list of uh, a list of really big, truly big questions in fundamental physics. Uh, the first one is close to my heart, which is um, what is the amplitude of primordial gravitational waves from inflation? Um, in addition, with these survey um, measurements, we can measure the sum of neutrino mass. We can probe whether the extra thermalized dark radiation from the early universe. We can probe at the particle nature of dark matter and really get at the question of whether it's dark energy cosmological constant or modified gravity that's driving uh, the late acceleration of the universe. And I've filed this category of questions under uh, extending our, our standard lambda CDM cosmological model. So in summary, um, while there are uh, hints of tensions, lambda CDM so far is a great success in uh, describing almost all of our observations. Now, and jointly with CMB and optical probes, um, what, it, what they offer is that there are multiple handles uh, to, fit, to probe physics uh, of our universe throughout its, its, its age. With that, I will um, start the CMB part of, of the talk, and I will focus on two areas uh, because of limited time. Uh, the first one is um, new advances in the search of primordial gravitational wave from inflation. And I say new because uh, I literally just put out uh, a paper on the archive yesterday. And so, so I'll be sharing the results from that today. Um, and the second area are um, new measurements uh, that inform potential consistency or inconsistency of the Lambda CDM model. So I'll be using two handles. One is the, the, the measurements of CMB and isotropies, both in temperature and polarization, and also CMB lensing. Now, primordial gravitational waves. Um, so the earliest um, moments of the universe is described by inflation. That is a, the most compelling paradigm, time paradigm that cosmology, cosmologists regards uh, today. So this inflation in, in a broad range of theories uh, generically predicts the existence of primordial gravitational waves. And it turns out um, the B mode polarization of the CMB recombination has a really unique window to these primordial gravitational waves. And let me uh, walk you through that, um, uh, that, that argument in, in three steps. Um, so at, at inflation, we have perturbations of the metric um, and the perturbations can be in scalar, vector, or tensor perturbations. Uh, the vector perturbations typically decay in simple models, so we can ignore them for now. So we are left with these two kinds of perturbations on the left. So through inflation, the tensor perturbation gets stretched into classical, um, primordial, uh, classical gravitational waves. So when the CMB was forming, what it does is that it's blue shift and red shift the photons and that effectively provide, um, make the CMB photons polarized. Um, on, the, on the right here, you see that um, we CMB physicists like to put our CMB polarization basis in what we call the E modes and B modes. Um, they are like our EM, uh, co free and divergence free basis of polarization. And um, these primordial gravitational waves imprint the, both E modes and B modes on the CMB. Now, if we look at the other source of uh, uh, perturbations, the scalar perturbations, uh, they create density waves. They are actually the seed of structure formation. And at the formation of the CMB at recombination, uh, they can only source E modes to first order. So now if you link um, this picture, uh, we get B modes only from primordial gravitational waves. So if we can see them at, at recombination, uh, that lends strong support that, that is from inflation. Now, um, the tensor, um, we, with the, the tensor perturbations, the amplitude of the tensor perturbations is directly related to the energy scale of inflation. And um, as we physicists like to parameterize things, we tend to want to give it a letter and, and the ratio of the tensor perturbation to the scalar perturbation spectrum 
as what we call R. And um, uh, written in this form uh, tells you that that is, we will be probing physics around uh, the gut scale. Uh, in addition, um, even setting an upper limit on R um, will inform us of um, some nature of quantum gravity and uh, various gravity theories. And of course, it will in inform inflationary model building. So there are plenty of physics um, motivation to look for this signature. Now, um, at getting to this signature is incredibly challenging. Um, the first challenge is that it's a tiny signal. Uh, given the current upper limit on R, the tensor to scalar ratio, um, we, we, the, the fluctuations in the CMB maps are expected to be on the order of uh, hundreds of nanokelvins. So on the right here, I'm showing the CMB temperature E mode and uh, a suite of B mode polarization spectrum measurement um, predictions. So the temperature spectrum is well measured. I haven't put data points on them. Um, as you can see, it's orders of magnitude uh, above the um, uh, two potential R um, um, curve of uh, gravitational wave generated B modes in these dotted lines. So that's so, so the um, gravitational wave generated B modes are extremely tiny. That's not the first challenge. The, there are other confusing, uh, confounding B modes um, in the foregrounds. One is from our own galaxy, so galactic foregrounds that's denoted in the green dash dot line here. Um, um, and that's and the amplitude and the cleanest, uh, one of the cleanest 1% on the sky at 150 gigahertz. Uh, already drown, um, for example, this R equals 0.1 line, and that's already above the current upper limit of R. Uh, fortunately, um, these foregrounds have different spectral signature compared to the CMB. So with multi-frequency observations, we can tease them out from the CMB measurements. And really the, the main character uh, of my talk will be, uh, well, one part of my talk is uh, these lensing uh, generated B modes um, that's denoted you know, in this black solid line. And uh, if R is much lower than R equals 0.1, you can see that it's, it will be um, overwhelming our primordial B modes. Now, um, our direct limit of R uh, is com uh, comes from the bicep kick uh, CMB experiments uh, from our, their B mode direct measurements. Uh, the upper limit of R is less than 0.07. Um, and uh, if you add temperature and emo polarization to that uh, constraint, you can reduce uh, the R upper limit to um, even lower, um, which is about 0.044. So that gives you a, a sense of how, how, how tight, how low that, that, that ceiling is. Now I want to focus on CMB lensing a little bit. The, um, what I say that uh, lensing of emotes generate these B modes, uh, the quick intuition there is that um, we have this background CMB that travels through the intervening gravitational potential and their, uh, their paths got deflected. Um, so the um, lens field is a distorted version of the unlensed field, which is described by gradient of phi. Sorry, I'm missing a close parenthesis. So this phi is a weighted gravitational potential integrated along the line of say. Um, so let's say you um, have initially just uh, an E-mode with, with a distortion of gravitational lensing. Um, this is a mixed E and B mode, uh, so no longer um, a pure E-mode. Um, in map, this is what it looks like. This is a lensed picture for T, E, and B. Um, so these are a lensed picture. So you can see the lensing B-mode coming out um, after lensing. And let me overlay that. Uh, with an R equals 0.1 fluctuation at the bottom panel. Um, so these are the signal that we are trying to go after um, in, in this foreground. Okay, so we have to clean the foregrounds, we have to de-lens, um, and this de-lensing part in, I'm particularly excited about because it hasn't been demonstrated to reduce uh, our uncertainty on data uh, until yesterday. Uh, and, um, but let's not forget that um, we have these temperature and email measurements, and they are actually foundational to our lambda CDM um, model, uh, our six parameter lambda CDM model. So the measurements of temperature emote um, 
uh, polarization spectrum will let us stress test on the CDM in addition to being sensitive to our extension. So now we uh, introduce the telescopes. Um, both the bicep cat and the South Pole telescope observed from the South Pole. This is an area photograph of the CMB uh, of the South Pole. And uh, it turns out the South Pole has excellent con conditions for lower middle wave observations. Now, a poll question is um, what what makes South Pole great um, for more middle wave observations? Now, if you can um, go to the poll and uh, put in your answers, I'm going to stop showing response for 20 seconds so that um, you all can uh, decide on your own what are the, all the options that apply um, to make South Pole a, a good um, observing site. Oh, wow, we have, uh, we have we have rapidly rising uh, uh, responses. All right, it's slowing down. So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a response now. Let's look at it. Oh, it is a desert. Excellent, that is, that is correct. It's high elevation, that is correct as well. So um, for low middle wave observations, the most important quality of the site is, is low um, precipitable water vapor content. So the South Pole being a desert, and it has having a high elevation are, are key. Uh, uh, it has little light pollution, it is true, but it's actually not very important uh, for CMB observations. And uh, a fun fact is that the sun only rises or sets one and sets once every year. Um, and that is actually, um, oh, can I lock this? That's actually important um, so that there is little uh, fluctuations in the atmosphere. Um, and, and we can observe throughout all the 24 hours during, during the, the austral winter. Penguins is the best answer, of course. All right, um, um, and I'll, I will skip addressing gray seeing. All right, uh, can I go to the next slide? Hmm? Yep, all right. So the bicep keck and the South Pole telescope. So I'll address a few um, key features that are similar uh, amongst the two sets of telescopes and um, some key differences that makes um, um, using both data sets extremely important. So both the bicep array and the, and the South Pole telescopes observe the same patch for, for most of the year. So that is essential for joint analysis. And, um, and um, the multi, they also observe, oh, there is a question. There isn't, yeah, actually there isn't, there isn't penguins at the South Pole. I just wanna make that very clear. Uh, I put penguins there just for fun. Um, um, <laughs> all right, um, both, both telescopes have multi-frequency detectors and optics. Um, um, and that's really important for, for constraining galactic foregrounds, especially for the bicep array telescope. Um, one key difference between these two sets of telescopes uh, is that the bicep array telescopes have a small aperture. So these are compact. It's good for um, maneuvering them and um, mitigating certain, certain classes of uh, system, instrumental systematics. Uh, however, what that means is that the resolution of the CMB maps made from these observations are lower uh, compared to what one can do with a telescope like the South Pole Telescope. So the South Pole Telescope is a, it has a 10 meter dish and um, its resolution at 150 gigahertz is around one arc minute. Uh, what that means that is that you get these really high resolution fine images and the millimeter wave sky. Um, and it turns out to be extremely important for, for de-lensing and also CMB lensing reconstruction. Uh, for reference, um, the bicep a bicep receiver height is about this, this height. Um, so it's much smaller compared to the South Pole telescope. Um, because there is great uh, scientific synergy in, in some of the common sciences, both collaboration uh, the site um, pursuits, uh, we decide to form an umbrella organization called the South Pole Observatory. We had our first uh, collaboration meeting last year, and I'd like to highlight some of the Stanford, um, current and previous Stanford uh, students and postdocs. Um, 
uh, Stanford and Slack students and postdocs who were at that meeting um, to just show uh, great support uh, from from my institution to this. Now, uh, let me let me delve into uh, some of the details of this lensing work that help improve uh, the R constraint for the first time. Uh, the idea of the lensing is rather simple and beautiful. Um, so we know that the, the lensing demos come from lensing of uh, emotes. So you need an emote map, you lens it with a uh, lensing potential tracer, you get a lensing demo estimate. From these lensing demo estimates, uh, you cross correlate it with your observed BMO maps. So you know what is the lensing content in your observed BMO um, and you form auto cross vector. So for this analysis, we combine the bicep tech, um, self pole telescope and Planck um, polarization maps. We use a map of the cosmic infrared background as a lensing potential tracer. So cosmic infrared background are emissions of, uh, uh, from dusty star um, forming galaxies, which uh, tend to be higher redshift and they trace the lensing potential uh, re reasonably well. So that's a good tracer. Uh, from that, then you form your lensing demo template and add it to the existing bicep CAC leading R analysis. So just briefly, uh, the bicep CAC R analysis um, feeds and mounts in the small patch of the sky uh, that covers about 1% of the sky um, of the bicep CAC observations. It also use, uses map from uh, CMB satellites, those from Planck and WMAP. And these are important because then they, they give you information about uh, galactic foregrounds. So the new input here then in addition is the lensing template that we made by lensing the um, uh, combined polarization map with the um, CMB uh, lensing potential tracer. Then you form um, all possible auto and cross spectra of these maps and you use it to compare to the model. So this is a uh, subset of all of the um, auto and cross spectrum from this analysis of the lensing template between the lensing template and the bicep cap data and, and, the, and the Planck 350 data, uh, 353 gigahertz map. So these form are my, my data vector and I compare it to a model that describe R lensing, um, dust and synchrotron. And this is the money plot uh, with and without the lensing for the bicep CAC um, 2014, up to 2014 data set. Uh, the black line is uh, with the lensing. So the key takeaway there is that the upper limit of R is reduced and also the posterior uncertainty on the R measurement is reduced. Uh, in terms of numbers, the 95% upper limit on R is reduced from 0.09 to 0.082. All right. Um, so um, as I said, adding temperature and emails improve R some more. So, um, so this is not like a most tight constraint on R, but what makes me really excited about this analysis is that um, this is just the beginning. Um, the future analysis for R will be more and more dominated by the lensing uncertainty. Um, so with that, um, improving the R measurement uh, uncertainty with the lensing will be um, one of the key, um, one of the key um, uh, inputs. So we need to get better fire tracers moving forward and there are a few ways to do it. And um, we can combine the CIB with uh, galaxy tracers and also CMB phi reconstruction. Uh, this is work uh, done extensively by uh, our local postdoc Yuki Omori. Uh, in addition, we need to have uh, optimal methods for the CMB phi reconstruction. And this is an area with lots of innovation. And in particular, I like to highlight uh, work by postdoc Marius Malaya at Berkeley, um, in which he's shown uh, on a 100 square degree patch of observation using SPT pool, uh, comparing conventional methods of what we call the quadratic estimator, using a quadratic estimator, uh, the QE, uh, versus his new innovative approach of optimal lensing reconstruction um, with a Bayesian framework. Um, he improved the lensing amplitude uh, constraint by 20%. Um, the paper will, should be coming out in a few weeks, so watch out for that. It's a neat paper. Um, 
now just a bit of a forecast of where how 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 much more important the Lanzang will be for sigma r um, under the the joint uh, self observatory work. Uh, if we the lens the bicep array uh, data uh, that will have even more multiple deeper multiple frequency maps uh, with a SPT three G um, uh, CMB map we constructed five we can improve sigma r by more than a factor of two and a half. And just to highlight how, how much more of an improvement in sigma R than it is uh, of, the, of the analysis that I just put out. And what I've shown here um, in this figure on the right is uh, sigma R as a function of time with and without the lensing. Um, and, um, and at the end of the, of the observing um, time for, for both surveys, uh, sigma R is projected to be uh, at three times 10 to the minus three. So far, I've been talking about uh, lensing uh, as, as a nuisance, as a foreground to blocking my, my R measurement. Uh, of course, one person's nuisance is another person's signal. And, and actually, this phi measurement uh, uh, from the CMB is extremely interesting for, for understanding and quantifying various areas of, of, of lambda CDM. Um, as, as you can see, uh, phi is the integrated um, projected mass, mass density, uh, mass distribution. So it's sensitive to uh, lambda CDM parameters that, are, that describe matter density, um, structure growth. So you can use it to constrain things like the sum of internal masses, various dark matter models, and of course, address cosmic tensions. Uh, so I'll show you one example um, of, of uh, a CMB lensing map. So this is a projected mass distribution map that I made using um, SPT pool data over 500 square degree field that overlaps with bicep cap. Uh, there are many things that I'm proud of about this map, but I can only highlight a few. And really, I want to talk about the cosmological parameter imp implications. So it is um, the highest po CMB polarization map only CMB uh, lensing spectrum measurement to date. And uh, with that, you can you can you can provide constraints on uh, parameters like um, sigma eight that describe the clustering of matter. Uh, and, and of course, I now would sound like a broken record. It can use, be, be used as a phi tracer for delensing. So this is a uh, one, one set of parameter of constraint coming from the um, spectrum measurements of the map that I just shown you. So this is what work left by uh, postdoc. Federico Bianchini, who's going to be joining KIFAC in a couple of months. Um, so an or orange contour um, shows the constraint in sigma 8 and omega matter plane and the sigma 8 and omega matter plane from, from the measurement. And as you can see, it is consistent with a couple other uh, CMB lensing measurements that's in the blue box. Uh, the black dot uh, comes from CMB primary um, spectrum measurements, so it's much tighter. And one thing to, to compare and contrast is that obviously our, 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 what CMB is sensitive to in the large scale structure, um, the optical survey uh, measurements are sensitive to as well. So I uh, list in the, the all surveys in the red box are, uh, comes from optical surveys and they're um, broadly in agreement with each other. However, if you scrutinize slightly more carefully there's some level of tension uh, between the Planck primary um, CMB inferred uh, sigma eight combination of sigma eight and omega matter uh, with the optical uh, measurements. Um, and that's something that Daniel is gonna um, go over a bit more. Um, an exciting new venue uh, is that you can combine the CMB lensing measurements with the optical uh, galaxy, gal galaxy density, galaxy, galaxy lensing and cosmic shear measurements to further tighten um, the constraints on the combination of sigma-8 and omega matter. Uh, so this is work led by Yuki, Homori, and Kaipak. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the result uh, of that analysis. To finish, I just wanted to highlight um, um, the, 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 the part of the CMB I haven't quite focused on, which is the primary CMB spectrum measurements. And uh, one thing that is particularly exciting is that um, we'll be releasing um, 
one of one of the first result, science results from the new camera on the South Pole Telescope uh, SPT3G. So this is work uh, led by Dan Grash, now postdoc Daniel Dutcher um, at Princeton, and uh, and also Leonard Bucknell at Melbourne. So this is a measurement of the um, EE power spectrum and TE cross spectra of the primary CMB, and uh, the particular particularly exciting aspect of this analysis is that uh, even just using a few months of data from 2018 from SPT3G, uh, the lambda CDM parameter constraints are already better uh, compared with the full season ST SPT pole, uh, which is a previous generation camera on, on the South Pole Telescope. Um, so, so that's a lot to look forward to. Uh, in particular, um, I'd like to highlight that the uncertainty on the Hubble parameter H0 is uh, around 1.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and, um, and that is similar to the most recent uh, ACT, which is our um, sister telescope at Chile, uh, DR4 release, um, and that will provide an independent measurement of H0 from Planck. Uh, continuing the conversation of uh, Con consistency on x naught measurements or inconsistency of x naught measurements across um, experiments and probes. Uh, from here, I'll pass it over to Daniel. Great, thank you, Kimmy. Let me just see, we, we smoothly uh, move on in our talk. You heard a lot about E modes and B modes uh, by Kimmy previously. Uh, and I want you to try out you know, this URL again, polapp.com slash tgroup and uh, do some life science and see whether you can see any E modes in this image. So this image is, is kind of our, our change of themes here now is the kind of data that I'm mostly working with, uh, taking deep images of the sky. Uh, most of the little bright blobs you can see in this image are distant galaxies in our universe. Uh, some of the brighter ones are stars in our own galaxy. So they're kind of a nuisance. Uh, but mostly what we do in these surveys is find and measure photometric properties of hundreds of millions, um, soon billions of these galaxies. And uh, so let's see whether any of you has clicked here already. Yep, so there's, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have maybe looked very closely at their screen. Uh, and maybe if you do that, then you'll see that there are these arc-like features that are kind of surrounding this blob of many galaxies. That's a galaxy cluster. And indeed, there's these positive emote shaped like images of background galaxies around it caused by strong gravitational lensing. Uh, others of you have put down pointers in, in other places and you're, you're kind of still right. So gravitational lensing happens everywhere in this image, um, just causing much smaller distortions that are harder to see or impossible to see at a particular location, but with statistics that we can still use to tell us about the matter density field. So these are, you know, these are my emotes uh, that I'm trying to measure. So, oops, how can I move to the next slide? Somehow we're stuck here. Exactly. So this is just a sketch of what is going on uh, particularly strongly in this area here. There's a galaxy cluster and the light of background galaxies is distorted on its path towards us. And as a result of that, you see these you know, heavily distorted emote-like arc images of those uh, distant galaxies. Now, uh, optical surveys use that effect to trace structure, uh, but not just that. The positions of galaxies and their clustering, these gravitational lensing signals that I already told you about, also the positions of galaxy clusters and their clustering, for instance, there are two point functions that tell us a lot about the clustering of matter density. And that is the, the quantity that you know, we have type predictions on from gravity, general relativity, and lambda CDM that we want to test. Also the abundance of galaxy clusters, just how many of these very massive objects end up forming in our universe is such a very sensitive problem. Uh, gravitational lensing among these is probably the most direct. Uh, this positive E mode that you can see in galaxy shapes is directly proportional to the overdensity of matter. So if you measure some tangential alignment on a circle of radius theta, that's going to be equal to the matter density inside that circle minus the matter density on the edge of that circle. And then just normalized by this factor here that has to do with the distances of us to the sources to, uh, to the lenses. Um, so because distance equals look back time in the universe, the further back something 
the, the earlier in the history of the universe you see it, um, doing this gravitational lensing to, out to different redshifts actually enables us to reconstruct not just structure at one time, but the evolution of structure throughout the history of the universe. So that's a very powerful thing to really test uh, gravity with. And in order to do that, uh, what we need to do is measure two things really. We need to measure the shapes of galaxies whose E-mode-like distortions we can then find. And we also need to know the distances to these galaxies such that we can translate those E-mode-like distortions into properties of the matter density. And that's where my work is, is a little harder. I kind of envy Kimi for already knowing what the distance to her background source is, uh, the cross microwave background. For us, that's something that we always have to figure out, you know, all these very faint blobs, how far away from us uh, they, they, they really are. So in terms of this overarching theme here, uh, with measurements of, uh, you know, made by telescopes, we mostly probe that later part uh, of the evolution of structure in the universe. That's how far out we see galaxies and, and we see background galaxies lensed by, by foreground structure. And so I want to go back to a poll, oops, and hopefully this is refreshed in a second, uh, and see what your intuition is on uh, the effect of dark energy on the growth of structure. Um, so you know, in this greater scheme of things, you know, dark energy is accelerating the expansion of the universe at late times. What does that do to the growth of structure inside that universe? Does it speed up that, you know, that growth of structure at early times um, or slow it down at early times or speed it up at late times or slow it down at late times? Or does dark energy not affect the growth of structure? And uh, well, wait a couple seconds for you to enter that URL and, and uh, enter what you think is, is the real answer. A few people are actively responding. Let's give it a few more seconds. Okay, let's see what your answer is. Yes, so most of you uh, think that dark energy slows down the growth of structure at late times, and that's indeed the correct answer. Uh, some mixed opinions, you know, maybe it depends what exactly dark energy is, but if it's a cosmological constant that just acts the way that we predicted in lambda CDM, D is indeed what it would do. Now, oops, going back to this image then, it's really an interesting regime that we're able to probe with these photometric surveys because we're observing the universe across this transition from being matter dominated, dark energy not really mattering, structure growing happily to this regime where dark energy starts driving things apart. The sketch here is actually a sketch of the flow of galaxies in our very local environment. There's two of these super clusters of galaxies forming around us and you know the sad reality is that those superclusters are never actually going to form. They're, they're diffuse enough that if dark energy is, in is indeed what we think it is, a cosmological constant with the density of sort of 70% the current critical density, these galaxies are never going to meet. They're, they're, they're going to blow, be blown apart by the accelerated expansion of the universe. So this is sort of the age that we're living in. Now that's the reason, the fact that these photometric surveys are so good at probing dark energy that you know, maybe the leading experiment, certainly uh, the experiment that I'm working on and many of us at Stanford and Slack are working on is called the Dark Energy Survey. So the Dark Energy Survey has imaged 5,000 square degrees of the southern sky uh, with a telescope in multiple filter bands. It took us five and a half years to do that and more than 400 scientists to build that instrument, perform that survey and analyze that data with the primary goal of constraining the equation of state, the ratio of pressure and density of dark energy uh, using different probes, large scale structure, cluster counts and gravitational lensing, which I told you about, also supernovae that we find in that, uh, in that data and that allow us a, uh, a measurement of the geometry of the expansion of the universe. So our status is that we have all the key results published from our first year of data. Uh, we have actually unblinded the key results of three years worth of data on election day. And you know, since election day, we know what the result is, but we, you know, we still have 
uh, some tests to do and some checks for consistency to do. And I would love that statement to not be a double entendre and not because DS shouldn't do it. We should definitely do it, but because the election should really be over. Um, and we actually finished our data taking. So we have twice as much data um, of high quality already in the can. You can download a lot of our data products and we're releasing them continuously here on our website if you want to uh, you know, do really anything with them. So it takes a real village to do this kind of survey. And I, you know, I do want to emphasize that. But today, I'll actually mostly highlight work that's done here at Stanford and Slack by uh, particularly the, the fantastic uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, that are working on, on DES over the past several years. Um, and, you know, kind of addressing if, if there's one question that we're after, then this question that uh, Kimi already touched upon. So this is a comparison of the amplitude of structure at the present time that you would expect from the latest and greatest measurement of the primordial universe, the baby universe uh, with the cosmic microwave background as measured by the Planck satellite here in this gray bar, compared to what we actually measure when we look at the fairly recent universe with these lensing surveys. Those are all the colorful data points down here. And so when you look at that plot, you kind of can't help but notice that all the colorful data points are below that gray bar. Um, the question is what that means. You know, does it mean that there is truly less structure today than you would predict from the CMB and extrapolating in, in our otherwise very successful model of cosmology? Is it, a, is it just a statistical fluke, right? The error bars on these colorful data points are all pretty large. Um, is it a systematic thing? Are, are maybe all these lensing um, surveys doing the same thing wrong? Or is there maybe something wrong in interpreting the CMB data because of something in the early universe that we didn't quite understand? Yeah. Is, there, is there a sign of, of new physics anywhere in here? Uh, that would be exciting. So really, you know, it's up to us to put even better data points on this plot that can enlighten what is really going on. And better meaning not just smaller statistical error bars, but also you know, smaller systematic uncertainties to them. The latest data point on this diagram actually, and the one with the smallest statistical plus systematic error bars uh, that I'm certainly aware of, is due to Chun Hao Chao, who's a PhD student here uh, at Stanford. And it's combining all the DES data, um, both these two point functions of galaxy clustering and, uh, and gravitational shear, but also information about galaxy clusters that we find in our survey to this red joint contour. And so this is a constraint on the matter density of the universe at the present time and the amplitude of structure at the present time that you can really compare eye to eye to what you would get from observations of the primordial universe as can be done by, uh, by the Planck satellites, observations of the cosmic microwave background. So these two are really uh, very comparable in size, particularly in this interesting direction that my cursor is drawing. And they're just barely consistent still. So, you know, we're really, we're really, really excited uh, to continue to find out when that red contour is shrinking, where it's going to go. And as I told you, we're going to find out very soon, right? Somewhere behind this gray box lies the answer to, you know, three times as much data that we've analyzed with DES that I cannot show you today. But, uh, you know, it will certainly add uh, key insights to this current puzzle of cosmology. So this is what our data looks like. Uh, this is a lensing map, a map of the matter density of the universe made from 100 million galaxy shapes that we've measured over almost our full footprint, 5,000 square degrees of the southern sky. And that's the data that we're, we're working with and that we have unblinded uh, cosmology results from. And I kind of want you to step in my shoes for a second and you know, uh, being partially responsible for the lensing analysis, kind of try to understand you know, what gets me to wake up cold sweated at night. You know, what would you worry about if you had to infer cosmology from 100 million galaxy images? Uh, what's, what's, you know, what could be going wrong? Is it, is it the bright galaxies that you select uh, as lenses in your analysis? Is it measuring the shapes of these faint and lensed galaxies? Is it calibrating the retro distributions, the, the, the distances of the lensed galaxies? Is it modeling those two point signals correctly? Or is it you know, getting your covariance and your sampling right and understanding the posterior of your Bayesian analysis of this data? Uh, so we'll 
wait what a second see what you think is uh is maybe the are the most important words i can tell you that all of these things are uh you know a challenge each time we do them because each time we do them we have to do them more accurately given the increase in data that we're collecting so you know you can definitely spend a very uh, valuable scientific career focusing on just a, a subset of one of these and uh, that's kind of what uh, these cosmological surveys are now like and let's see what some of you think okay I'm not sure how much i've primed you there uh, but uh, certainly the most popular answer seems that calibrating the retro distributions of galaxies is hard and it is it is hard measuring the shapes of faint galaxies is hard too all of these are hard uh, but let's look at just a few innovations that we're making in BES, particularly on these most pressing points. And so again, I want to highlight work uh, done by graduate students here at Stanford, particularly um, on calibrating source galaxy retro distributions. So these distances, uh, we've developed an all new framework uh, to do this. Uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, really using all the data that we have, both secure redshifts of galaxies from spectroscopy and multiband deep fields deep photometry that we have over a subset of our area and then the wide photometry that we have over 5,000 square degrees combines these in a consistent way for the first time adds clustering constraints and constraints from what we call shear ratios the ratios of lensing signals and that you know that whole system the person leading it is Justin Miles PhD student here uh, with me at Slack um, and you know, Alex Abana, a postdoc as well, has, has done key pieces of that analysis. So we're very proud of our well-calibrated redshift distributions. Likewise, the measurements of source galaxy shapes, um, we have um, done careful image simulations that show a new effect. You know, the shapes that we measure of galaxies really respond to shear of light at different redshifts. And that's because what we think is a single galaxy in our image is really almost always a superposition of one bright galaxy and a bunch of other fainter galaxies at different redshifts. And so for the first time, we found that, you know, that actually matters, uh, especially for our high redshift galaxies. They do respond to shear at lower redshift in ways we didn't expect. One of the people really essential to figuring that out is Jamie McCulloch here, a PhD student at Stanford, together again with Alex Amon and me. Uh, and this is, this is again, I think something that will, will stick and that will be even more important for future surveys to get right. Lots of work going on in the modeling of lensing signals here at Stanford, particularly in validating the whole analysis using simulations. That's something that you know, Risa Bexler, uh, Eli Rakov, and Jody Rose have been working on um, for years, and you know, we're very proud to have our full analysis end-to-end -end done on simulations. And so I'll just give you a glimpse of what the DES data looks like. This is from the cosmic shear analysis led by Alex Amon here. Um, so this is the cosmic shear two-point correlation functions of the shapes of galaxies. So you take pairs of galaxies and you measure you know, how aligned statistically their shapes are uh, with respect to one another. There's two kinds of such correlation functions you can do um, because of the symmetry. Um, and what you see in yellow here are the blinded. So we've modified this plot so you couldn't do cosmology with it while I speak. Uh, the blinded correlation functions with their error bars compared to blue, those are the error bars that we had from DES year one, uh, which is still you know, among the leading cosmic shear analysis after, after three years. You can see that you know we're almost getting better by a factor of two. Uh, so it's really an impressive increase in the statistical power, uh, even more so here at high redshift, uh, where a lot of the cosmological signal lies. So this is, you know, as you can see, very very valuable data that we are now in a position to carefully analyze. The complete analysis uh, has been done blindly, so you know we didn't actually look at what our result was for three years up to November 3rd. And uh, Jesse Moore here, a Porat fellow uh, at Stanford has actually developed the methodology for doing that consistently with such a multi-probe analysis that uses different types of measurements. And so that's that's not that trivial. And, uh, and you know her methodology was adopted and I think will be for future analysis. This is our uh, before picture. So don't read anything into the facial expressions here of the unblinding Calicon. Uh, the whole project was coordinated by Michael Troxell, uh, and he's, he's done a fantastic job at bringing you know, dozens of people together over, over three years uh, to make this happen. 
Um, one success that I can share already is we've really made great progress on these calibration uncertainties that I talked about. Shapes and redshifts are not limiting us. We'll have to keep working on those for the next generation. And we're still working on numerous tests of internal consistency, robustness, and external consistency. Uh, but when we're done with that, you know, you should be looking forward to what is the most reliable uh, constraint of late time structure from an optical survey uh, ever, ever made. So with that, you know, we will be able to compare these two pictures of the universe that Kimi started us off with, right? the, the baby picture of tiny fluctuations in the early universe and this grown up picture of the matter density field that you know, both the CMB lensing and, and these photometric surveys are measuring. Um, I won't be able to talk about you know, one of the wonderful features of the latter, which is that it is highly non-Gaussian structures. So unlike the primordial CMB, we know that density fluctuations at the present day are very non-Gaussian and that can you know, allow much more detailed analysis of what is going on, but that's for another time. And I think this leads us to a little bit of an outlook of this thing. If this thing allows me to continue, oops, exactly. So looking at the future, in terms of optical surveys, the floodgates are really open. We're gonna see an increase in data volume by these experiments by a factor of several every few years. And uh, that, you know, DES will have twice as much data uh, ready to analyze any time. LSST and Euclid are going to come online in the mid 2020s and just blow everything out of the water. Uh, LSST year one data is gonna be 30 times the DES year one data. So you know, just imagine the challenges keeping up with that. And uh, you know, Slack and Sanford are definitely uh, helping a lot on addressing all these challenges right now. I think Kimi has some more on CMB. Yep, um, so looking to the future, one of the um, key next generation ground-based CMB experiments is uh, what we call CMBS-4. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, CMBS-4 will have telescopes at both the Chile Atacama Desert and at the South Pole. Um, and there will be orders of 500, half a million detectors in all of these spread across all of these telescopes. To give you a sense of scale, um, the SPT-3G receiver currently on the order of uh, um, 10,000, um, 10, yeah, 10,000 detectors. Um, actually, I might have that number wrong, so don't call me on that. Um, and uh, there will be petabytes of data um, uh, from, from, from this telescope. Um, there are amongst um, um, what we have talked about so far, a uh, few key science themes. Um, uh, the first one is inflation and primordial gravitational waves that uh, I've covered quite a bit in this talk. Um, and uh, then the next one is early universe light relics and, uh, and the nature of dark matter. Um, so this would be a very exciting uh, new avenue, uh, avenue um, that uh, CMBS4 will pursue. And of course, with a very broad survey covering over 70% of the sky, uh, we can make uh, CMB lensing maps uh, over all of that area to extremely high signal to noise and be able to do a lot of the cross correlations with optical surveys and along um, as we've, we've described um, in this talk. And um, something that's uh, quite new to the millimeter wave uh, community is that we can also be doing multi-messenger astronomy to be um, uh, observing in the millimeter wave some of these transient events. So that will be very exciting. So to conclude, um, we'd like to also yeah, just bring up uh, the overlaps of the CMBS-4 and the optical surveys. So this is some of the footprints of a few of the upcoming surveys, including LSST and DESI, and um, that CMBS-4 will be covering uh, large swaths of the sky. So there could be ample joint analysis and complementarity between these surveys. And uh, we can continue to stress test our lambda -CM CDM model and look for new physics. And there are multiple ways to enhance and cross-check uh, measurements. Um, so I'll, um, then we want to add to this slide. That sounds great. No, yeah. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Daniel and Kimmy and we have time for questions. 
you can raise your hand in the chat. Maybe while we're waiting, I'll ask a question. Um, we heard sort of about the optical side and the CMB side, and we didn't hear a lot about the combination. Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, um, I can mention one thing that I know uh, postdoc Yuki Omori uh, is, is leading on. Um, so in particular, so for the DSY3 analysis, um, so for the key analysis, there is the usual three by two point analysis. So that includes um, galaxy, 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 galaxy lensing and cosmic shape. Uh, and he's leading the work of combining the CMB lensing map. So joining CMB lensing crossing with the, the, the um, three by two point uh, 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 measurement. Um, and, and in some preliminary tests in terms of the statistical uncertainty, uh, on constraining uh, a combination of sigma eight omega matter, um, what we call S eight, um, it does look like the the constraint on that will improve by a further ten or so percent. So that's that's extremely inter interesting. That's exactly right, and I'll I'll add that you know that consistency is also it's really another great cross check, right? So if there's any systematics in either of these uh, measurements that are you know, incredibly hard. So you know, even if you're very careful, you, know, you should always be confronting your results with as many checks as possible. Then you know, that's, that's one check that I think is particularly independent uh, of whether everybody got their data understood correctly. Okay, questions from the audience? Tom, go ahead. Oh yeah, just a quick one on Daniel. Like, um, you know, Daniel, you showed the maps that you know you couldn't tell us all the results about yet. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, there's a very uh, peculiar or particular scale that pops out with all your blue dots there. Um, do you want to say more about and explain a bit more to to all of us what that scale is? So one thing I didn't tell you about that map is that there is implicitly a filter applied, a smoothing filter applied to that map. So you can't, you know, and the shape of an individual galaxy contains very little information, signal noise of much less than one on, you know, what the density and the, the shear at that position is. So you really need to average thousands of galaxies before you get any sense of, you know, is this a over density or under density? And so in this image, you know, we've, we've done that within a filter and the, the scale of our densities here that you see is essentially smoothed by that filter. So that's, that's the smallest over densities that you could I make out here. The, the bright blue spots uh, is sort of your filtering scale. And now I could just go ahead and count all of them and do square it in to tell me about what sort of variance you get on that scale. Exactly. All right, thanks, bud. Then you can ditch us. More questions? Any students in the audience have a question? Any non-cosmologists in the audience have a question? OK, maybe it's just too late in the day. Um, oh, Justin, go for it. I was just wondering, uh, could you say more about some of the challenges with simulations? Um, uh, de develop like what challenges need to be solved for developing simulations to accompany these data? So uh, th this is you know this could have multiple prongs. I'm not sure what you know what thoughts come to Kimi's mind first. Risa is another real expert on that, so I don't I don't know how to answer all that. Um, for for late time structure, really the difficulty is knowing what happens on nonlinear scales, uh, knowing what happens to just the dark matter on nonlinear scales. You need simulations to calibrate that, but even more, knowing what baryons and you know the astrophysics that impact where galaxies form and what they end up looking like and how they 
intrinsically aligned to one another. So these are all effects that are limiting what we can learn um, from the galaxy surveys, unless we can inform our analysis by simulations. And so for the stuff that dark matter is doing, I think we're pretty good. For the stuff that baryons are doing, we're still very much in a phase of, you know, uh, different groups using different secret recipes to get slightly different answers. So yeah, I think there, you know, there's a there's a, a, a long uh, way to go, but a way that is going to be very, um, you know, uh, very much paying off given the data that we're collecting and that uh, such simulation based studies can help us interpret. There's another way in which we use simulations, which is to validate our, uh, you know, our way of analyzing the data. And that is, I would say, equally as important. Um, Yeah, on the CMB side, um, I have swept under the rug of, of, of a lot of the um, issues that we have to confront because my part of the talk didn't quite focus on the systematics side. Um, but I would say that um, of simulations of foregrounds is actually one of the challenges, especially adding actually in a similar vein, um, the, the gas properties um, on, in, in, using embody simulations to describe um, uh, our foregrounds. So for the CMB on the low L, on the large angular scales, um, we have galactic foregrounds. So that in itself is extremely complex to model on the simulate. Uh, so that's one challenge. On the small angular scales, we have extra galactic foregrounds. So in the temperature and intensities, there are a few effects. So there is uh, a senior Soldovich effect uh, in the thermal and the kinetic kinematic um, TSZ and KSZ. Uh, also uh, the CIB itself emits and uh, modeling all of them consistently and uh, will be extremely important um, in the reconstruction of the CMB lensing field um, so that we won't be biased. Um, and that is important both for cos um, measuring cosmological parameters and also for the lensing. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'll be happy to talk more about that. Um, but I really did not address any of this in the talk. Okay, well, given the time, we should probably end, but uh, Daniel and Kimmy are available for questions later for, for anyone. So please feel free sure. to contact them. And uh, we'll also be doing a KIPAC colloquium with the DES results um, when they're available to be shared. So stay tuned for that. Um, thanks again to Kimmy and Daniel, and thanks to the whole audience.